decided to do my PhD at Vanderbilt University, mostly because there was the best funding, but the funding came with a fellowship called Theology and Practice that um, put people together from different um, different academic fields in religious studies, so ethics, theology, Bible, um, psychology, and, and pastoral care, uh, brought us together to think about how to do interdisciplinary mm -hmm. research and teaching that is supposed to be this kind of transformative type of research and teaching that speaks to the needs of society, uh, couched in the language of that particular fellowship, especially with regard to churches mm -hmm. as they work in the world. Um, but I also think more broadly because I'm interested in Jewish and Christian relations and also just general inter-religious relations and how that is a key aspect also of, of justice in society because so much of what we do, sometimes explicitly, sometimes tacitly, is connected to either a religious ideology or an anti-religious ideology. It's a big question that everybody should be pursuing because I think that, it, that we need to be thinking about it from the um, kind of systemic levels, right? It's not only about mm -hmm. some of the things that we put in our syllabi, things that we require in our curricula for certain degrees and certain programs. It's also about um, bigger issues uh, that uh, questions such as, and I mentioned, you know, the groups that have been underrepresented in society in general are also underrepresented in uh, higher education. And so one thing for me is just making sure that across institutions, all groups are represented as best that they can be. I, when I went, attended Vanderbilt my first year, I made a comment that there were that most of the students were white, and I had come from a program in Berkeley where the the program truly was global. There were students from different countries in Africa, from India, from Pan Asia, from Latin America, everywhere. People were coming from everywhere, and my advisor told me, "Well, Vanderbilt does draw students from this region primarily," and I thought we can do better than that. Yeah. Funding makes a difference. Um, going out and talking to different areas of the world to try to bring people in and draw them into programs and then setting up programs in ways that do attract the interests and needs, especially of the underrepresented groups, right? So that, and that's, it's so key and we tend to neglect it. I think it's so basic. And then that other step, that's so fundamental for me is making sure that we are talking about these core issues. Mm -hmm. I think we need to have room for narrative mm -hmm. in, in ways that we haven't in the past, to hear the narratives of people who are coming from different experiences than we are used to having, people who are coming from places where they this is where this is where social justice needs to be done, right? Mm -hmm. In urban centers around the world, in places where you know there are basic needs of clean water and you know food, right. um, to to hear these actual narratives from people in person, um, whether it's through Skype and maybe making some actual visits to these places, but also reading. Mm -hmm making sure that we're, 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 our, our syllabi require readings that are coming from these perspectives. When I create my own syllabi for religious studies, I, may, I make sure that it is global. Mm -hmm. I, I, I actually sit down and I count how many readings do I have from a white man? How many readings do I have from women? How many readings do I have from Latin America? How many from China? How many do I have from queer perspectives, right? How many women of color? Yeah, and the ironic and sad thing is that, you know, you can hire a faculty who is a person of color, even a woman of color who is doubly or maybe triply marginalized, and sometimes those syllabi, the readings can be more white than anybody else's because they feel like they have to prove right. that they have done all of the core, the core scholarship if we think of, um, it, it shouldn't be this way, but if we think that white male perspective is in the center, and you know, for each piece of your identity that is not white, and in this case in the United States, white English as first language, 
a heterosexual male, for each piece of your identity that moves away from that center, mm -hmm. the more you, I think you feel like you have to prove yourself and the more you have to step out of your own skin right. in order to perform in the academy in ways that will be acceptable. Right. And so I think for me then a key part of, of you know this social justice transformation is to um, transform the academy in a way that allows faculty and other key leaders to be able to be themselves, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to be in this connection with their true identities, mm -hmm. but also then to be able to embrace the diversity, to use the language that you mentioned, that, that this cultural diversity is so key. Mm -hmm. um, and, and allowing for that diversity to, to live rather than, you know, pushing certain types of diversity to the margins and saying, well, it's okay if you come from a different nation as long as you can speak English and you adhere to our Judeo-Christian values mm -hmm. and you can write in English and, you know, to, to allow for that true cultural diversity, which is so hard for us. The work that every course has to have, so I include that. And so biblical studies has to, you have to be able to do certain skills. You have to be able to write certain kinds of papers. So I have my students do that. And so once they've done that, I give them the freedom to do what I call a project. Choose your genre. Choose your audience. Choose what you would like to talk about now that's related to the topic of, of the course, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what have we been working on that you would like to investigate further? And how would you like to investigate it? Do you want to write a personal narrative? Do you want to write music? Do you want to create a drama, right? Um, to give them the opportunity. And some of them will be practical and will say, well, I'm going to be a pastor of this church, and so I need to write a sermon, and it needs to be a certain length, and this is the type of audience. But that's okay, too, because mm -hmm. that gives them a chance to practice a skill that they need. That, that is going to bridge a gap between their mm -hmm. academic education and their practical vocation. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them will take it and, and will write music, will write poetry. Uh, the first time I taught a course on Esther with graduate students, I got some magnificent artwork mm -hmm. that was really expressive of the body and the way that society imposes itself, especially on the female body. I got gorgeous poetry. It was just uh, the, the students really were able to take it in directions that allowed them to, to, to be themselves more or mm -hmm. to explore something that they'd been wanting to explore but had been repressed because, you know, they always have to write this academic paper, mm -hmm. three to five pages, eight to ten pages. Make sure you have at least these many sources cited. Make sure you use Chicago style, you know. Mm -hmm. So to give, give students that opportunity to, to find ways that they can express themselves. This pedagogy at the end of the day is at the bottom of the list of priorities. It's, and especially at the bigger research institutions, it's even more so about your research and about who you are at the face in the public sphere, right? Mm -hmm. Do people know who you are when we say your name? Do people look at your profile and say, oh, we want to study with that person? But, but, you know, to be able to do the interdisciplinary things and, and to, to engage the arts more and even to engage the sciences more in a way that, that can help us to, to figure out ways that certain skills and certain types of expression mm -hmm. might, might benefit different areas of study. You know, the arts themselves are always the first thing to get cut from any kind of program, right? When funding yes. when funding is low, it's the arts that get cut. Chicago public schools cut art classes from their curriculum quite a while ago because the funding just isn't there. And so people, students who come through Chicago public schools don't get any art. So if they don't have family who take the time and the intention to say, we're going to a museum once a month, or when one of the museums is free, we are just going to take that Saturday and go to say, okay, we need to give you some kind of instruction to help you explore because you clearly love to draw or you clearly love to write. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, that that, that if that's not there, I, I grew up I grew up with music. I wasn't so much a drawer or a painter, but I grew up with music, and so mm -hmm. I had the opportunity to play in the band. And I think that you know, music and arts, all of these, it it it, it does something for your intellect. It, it, psychology has done research mm -hmm. on that, right? And and so, you know, if I think through through the years, through all of the education, that that kind of funding, if it's getting cut, it's we're neglecting everybody, right? Um, and I think the academy is just as bad at, at, at neglecting that part of, of society. And my fellowship program, it, you know, it's an interdisciplinary program, so I'm talking to people who are studying ethics and religion, people studying theology and religion, people studying psychology and religion, but Vanderbilt has no religion and arts as a PhD, so we didn't really get the art piece of it, right? Mm -hmm. it, it keeps getting shoved to the side. Um, but that, that socioeconomic piece of just making sure that the people who are most likely to be, to be neglected mm -hmm. in having the materials that they need to read, to connect to the internet, to, to develop artistic skills, that this is just a core piece of it. Mm -hmm. and, and that I think that in higher education, we need to be aware that if it's not happening in the younger years, Maybe there's something that needs to be done that's a bit more cooperative, you know what I mean? I think that, that narrative, narrative is how we live. Narrative is how we think, right? I, uh, people who have a lot more expertise than I do in these things have said that to me before, that, that narrative is really the, the shared common okay. experience of humans and that it's in our narratives mm -hmm. that we connect. It's not in sitting down and calculating budgets it's not in trying to figure out, you know, the next scientific um, you biggest know. discovery. Exactly, but it's in those shared narratives mm -hmm. that we really connect with one another, which makes it the community. Exactly, and the questions of ethics, what is right and wrong, can be very, very tenuous, and you don't want students to necessarily try to find out what your perspective is to, in order to adopt it. You want them to learn huh. to grapple yeah. with the true, the true issues and to learn to think critically about it. Well, what, what are the advantages and disadvantages of each choice that I make? Uh, who am I harming by making this claim about God and who, who is benefiting if I say that God is a father who is all-powerful, right? Mm -hmm. If they don't know what I think, then they're, I think, more likely to come up with their own expression. Uh, and yet, how much do I, how, are there ways in which students are not benefiting because I'm not sharing my narrative and how I've gotten to what my own theological and uh, ideological perspectives are? Because everything we believe is based on our experiences. I would not be who I am, I would not believe what I believe if I didn't have the set of experiences that I did through my life. Right. And how can we carve our own identities for ourselves if we want to be able to, to express? And how is the academy then influencing how people think of themselves, right? If I am an instructor trying to help students become you know, social leaders of their own, uh, how can I help them to really figure out who they are and who they want to be as opposed to what you know, higher education says they should be?